the conviction of the people who stuck with us um, is so high because they are making this existential bet that says, hey, Solana is a platform where it's the only platform on earth where I can build the kind of product that I want to build. Um, and, you know, this is what I believe in and I will walk through fire to get there. And that is a high bar of conviction to, to think of someone saying that. And what we were left with, you know, through kind of all the trials of 23 and all the doubters and all the FUD and all the, uh, you know, stuff going on in the market and the governments was like everyone who was left necessarily had that view because anyone who was just like, oh shit, I'm out of here, they left. Um, and so we have this like battle hardened, you know, forged in fire community of people who stuck with us. And now that, you know, attention is coming back, the market is coming back, we're seeing all these new products and projects launch. Um, you know, we have this like really dedicated cohort of people who are like, we were here when it's hard, we're gonna be here when it's good. Um, you know, and like the latest kind of hype trend isn't gonna isn't gonna change like our conviction on this technology. And that is something I am like eternally grateful for. I mean, that is basically like who we built the network for. That's who I work for at the end of the day. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for hosting me. Glad we're uh, together in Denver uh, at the Ethereum conference, but thank you so much. Really looking forward to this. Yes, yeah, uh, great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So maybe just to start off, I think, you play a very vital role within the Solana ecosystem, but I feel like you're a little behind the scenes sometimes, whether you choose to or not. Uh, and I would love for kind of the audience uh, to really learn a little bit more about you, kind of the history of Solana. And so maybe if we could just start from the beginning, uh, how did you get involved in Solana Foundation? How did this all come to be? Sure. Um, yeah. So. Let's see, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Um, so uh, today, it's 2024, I'm, I'm serving as executive director for the Solana Foundation, um, but I guess the, the Solana story and at least my, my portion of it started, um, so way back in 2018, um, I worked at Qualcomm with one of the original Solana founders, um, uh, most of the technical founders and most of the early like core Solana developers were actually all former Qualcomm engineers. Um, and, uh, we were working on a couple projects together and, you know, it was 2018 and he took me out to lunch one day and he says, Hey, I've got a, got an idea for you. Um, I've got this friend, his name's Anatoly. He's a really smart guy. He wrote this white paper. We're trying this crypto thing and we're just hiring a couple people to see if we can get this off the ground. So do you want a job? Um, that was 2018. I actually put him off for a little while. Uh, had some other personal stuff going on and, um, uh, early 2019, I joined as, I think, employee number 10 in Solana Labs. Um, so this was pre-Mainnet. This was actually pre-Testnet even. Um, at the time, Testnet was um, a couple of scripts used to spin up like 10 GCP nodes and mm -hmm. run some super alpha software on there. Yep. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it was really just you know, Anatoly, the other founders, me and I don't know, four or five, maybe six other engineers. Uh, that was all of Solana at the time. Uh, it, it's pretty crazy just to me, like how kind of these origin stories really become and then how hard they actually scale, like over time. And it's really hard, I think, for the mind to kind of fathom uh, when you first start that journey to even where we are today to where we are going to go. It's yeah. massive. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, and it's in, it's happened in such a short time frame. I mean, it feels like an eternity in crypto, right? Five, yeah. five whole years, like, boy, how we've aged. But um, uh, yeah, and just sort of seeing like the, the trajectory of growth. I mean, there's so many projects now that like I can't even keep up with, with the latest and greatest in the ecosystem. And that's, it, it's honestly kind of overwhelming sometimes. And it's so inspiring to see. Um, you know, the only way that this project and this community are really going to continue to scale and continue to grow and continue to push the boundaries is through, you know, a, a, a huge multitude of community leaders and, and thought leaders and researchers and builders coming from all over the place, right? Not necessarily needing to, you know, talk to or know anyone at the Solana Foundation or talk to Anatoly or, you know, whatever, like we still try to stay engaged and, and helpful in the ecosystem. 
Um, but you know, I see our like our primary mandate here is just remove blockers for other people. Get out of get things out of their way and get out of their way and let them build, let them create. Um, and that's I think where we're, you know, really really seeing some uh, incredible uh, acceleration right now. One hundred percent. I think uh, the space has its very high highs and low lows. And maybe kind of fast forwarding a little bit to uh, the past year to twenty twenty three. Can you kind of talk about kind of the ups and downs like Solana went through as the entire industry, but I think Solana even more, um, how that kind of affected the team or the network, so to speak. Yeah, um, 2023 was a difficult year. Um, you know, in, in sort of the wake of the FTX blow up and all of the chain reactions that came before and after that, um, I think it really, unfortunately, like it shook a lot of people's confidence. Um, uh, and those who were, um, you know, sort of here for the flash and those who were here for, you know, the real kind of purpose of this technology, like were very quickly filtered out. Um, and that's not to say it was easy by any stretch for those of us who stuck around. Um, uh, and I think one of the, like kind of unique and awesome things that we've seen in Solana. And this was true even in 2021 when Solana kind of first came onto the scene and then sort of reproved itself again, I think in, in 2023 and now today in, in 24, is like the conviction of the people who stuck with us um, is so high because they are making this existential bet that says, hey, Solana is a platform where, it's the only platform on earth where I can build the kind of product that I want to build. Um, and you know, this is what I believe in and I will walk through fire to get there. And that is a high bar of conviction to, to think of someone saying that. And what we were left with, you know, through kind of all the trials of 23 and all the doubters and all the FUD and all the, uh, you know, stuff going on in the market and the governments was like everyone who was left necessarily had that view because anyone who was just like, oh, shit, I'm out of here. They left. Yeah. Um, and so we have this like battle hardened, you know, forged in fire community of people who stuck with us. And now that, you know, attention is coming back, the market is coming back, we're seeing all these new products and projects launch. Um, you know, we have this like really dedicated cohort of people who are like, we were here when it's hard, we're going to be here when it's good. Um, you know, and like the latest kind of hype trend isn't going to isn't going to change like our conviction on this technology. And that is something I am like eternally grateful for. I mean, that is basically like who we built the network for. That's who I work for at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, like what, you know, we built this awesome network. It's got, it's this blockchain. It's got incredible features that we can talk about until we're blue in the face, but it's not useful if no one uses it. And I think just kind of riffing off that point, I got involved in crypto in 2017 and kind of got a little jaded throughout that process because I felt like blockchains became unusable. Like they got expensive, they were confusing, they were complex. And to me, the more that I personally dove into Solana, the Solana architecture, and then used the blockchain, I was just very impressed by the simplicity. And I, as kind of a former product person, I want people to use the product because at the end of the day, if it's just a token or coin and number go up, sure, that's fun for a little bit, but what purpose does that actually serve to the world? And I've loved that Solana now, even today in 2024, people are using Solana because it's simplistic. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have as much complexity and people try it and they're like, wow, this, this is amazing. Yeah, it's it's really, um, I, I think it's, it's really in a class of its own. Um, and it's unfortunately, I think, been hard for some doubters to wrap their head around that is this really, is this even possible on a decentralized blockchain based on, you know, what we've seen in the past. And I, I it's like, you know, I, I want people to be open-minded. Um, you know, crypto as a whole changes all the time. It's incredibly disruptive technology. And to assume that the game is over, the game is won by any, any project, whether, you know, whether it's ETH, whether it's Solana, whether it's something else that hasn't even come around yet um, 
you know, no one should should have so much hubris as to think we have solved all the problems and someone isn't going to figure out a way to do something better or faster without actually compromising on the principles that that crypto is founded on. Um, and, you know, as a product, this was this was sort of what we designed Solana for. This is what we designed Solana around is can we create, you know, a truly decentralized system that is truly fast, is really cheap and synchronizes data all over the world as fast as physics allow. Um, as you know, we say, you know, blockchain at the speed of light. Um, it's not actually a meme. That is the limitation of the blockchain is the speed of light through fiber optic cable is 200 million meters per second. And the earth it has a circumference of 40,000 kilometers, which means the theoretical fastest you can send data around the planet is 200 milliseconds. Right? in a perfectly straight line with no latency and real world effects, right? Um, but that is the sort of physical limitation that Solana was designed for. So the continuous transaction streaming, the parallel processing in the runtime, um, the continuous block forwarding and block shred forwarding and fast consensus were designed so that data moves to all nodes in the network continuously through fiber that wraps the whole world and with the, with the goal being that you can have um, state on a blockchain, such as a, a pricing market, um, update to every node on Earth as fast as data travels through the internet, right? When news happens in London and someone finds out about it in New York a few milliseconds later and someone else finds out about it in Singapore a hundred milliseconds later, um, th the only latency there is how fast light travels through fiber. And this is the sort of design principle that we built Solana around to have this uniform global state machine. There's a bunch of ways we can take that. Uh, <laughs> I, I love the vision and I, I still think more broadly, the market and general crypto participants do not fully understand this. We could kind of take it down like the decentralization route of having high throughput and high decentralization. We could go down parallelization or kind of like the all to all communication. Is there any particular things that you feel like we should touch on at least first? Um, I think what, what, what's most important, I think, or maybe not most important, but what is really important for people is just use it. Yeah. Just try the chain. There are some incredible products out there. Um, Drip, Tensor, Jupiter, um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff happening in Dpin where you can like earn money for doing, you know, physical work or helium. You can run a hotspot hive mapper. You can, you know, get a dash cam and earn tokens for driving that you were going to drive anyway. Um, so there's a lot of really cool products. Um, infrastructure is useless unless people use it for yeah. something that they care about. Um, and I, I think that is underemphasized in the space because, you know, crypto rightly and wrongly has attracted some of the most brilliant minds in tech and the most brilliant minds in finance. And we dive into in incredibly interesting and esoteric technical problems um, without a lot of thought for, okay, but who's going to really use this thing, Yeah. right? That I've written a lot of academic papers on and we can have a lot of philosophical debates and these are important. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, products will drive the innovation cycle. I, I was talking with a bunch of people here in ETH Denver and I kind of was tired and a little bit frustrated with some of the conversations that I was having. And I, I tweeted right before bed that I was going to restake my uh, L2 into my L3 and then bridge from Arbitrum and then post it on Celestia. And, and to me, like, it's all like intellectually interesting. I love it personally. Like I, I really like to nerd out on like the technical details, but to your point, it's like, okay, this is all infrastructure. Where's the products? And I think that's what has been very refreshing to me. I know some Solana is relatively complicated from a technical standpoint, but I also think it's relatively dumb or simplistic in terms of you add more bandwidth and you add more compute. And I love that because it makes engineers and the product builders lives much easier because they know that they can get continued scale over time. Right. Yeah. I think if you look at Solana compared to, I'll say any singular piece of say the ethereum scaling stack right and the, the, the dev experience you say oh that's it's much more complex it, it has all these you know unique requirements and how we build smart contracts and transactions but if you look at it as at the whole which is all you need to do is build on solana and not 
also this bridge and also this L2 to get the kind of experience you want, you realize like the path to just simply thinking about what is the product that I want to build? What do I want to bring into the world that I'm excited about, that users are going to want to use, that adds value to their life? Just focus on that, yeah. right? And then there's one, one, one layer and there's all sorts of, you know, developer tools and resources and API and, you know, infrastructure services companies to help you get there. Yeah, no, it's, I'm very much appreciative of the engineers that allow the infrastructure engineers that allow application engineers to focus on applications because yes. application engineers should not <laughs> have to learn the infrastructure to build a good product. And I think, unfortunately, the world that we are in today with crypto, a lot of application engineers just want to build applications, but they're forced to make a lot of difficult decisions and where do I build? And I love the simplicity of just kind of one single global state machine. Right. I mean, it's sort of, you know, there's been this, uh, uh, you know, comparison is, you know, Solana is sort of like the taking the Apple model or the iOS model, right? Everything's integrated. Yeah. Um, the runtime was built in tandem with the networking protocols on purpose because they both, you know, were optimized for fast data propagation, parallel transaction processing, um, and it's sort of like saying, okay, well, anyone who ever wanted to develop um, an app for iPhone needs to learn all the intricacies of the iOS, you know, operating system stack. And say, like, no, that, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, you learn TypeScript or C Sharp, and you download the Apple SDK or the iOS SDK, and you go nuts. You build the product that you want to build on, and there's this beautiful platform ready for you with all so many users, um, and you know, and this rich market of of distribution and um, you know, basically like auto marketing on the on the App Store for for all of its challenges. It still you know brings a lot of app developers to a lot of people. Yeah, no, it's it's understated the importance of just allowing engineers to focus on what they should be focused on, which is products. Maybe shifting yeah. slightly, how do you kind of view Solana in today's world? Uh, we're coming into March of 2024. How are you feeling about the network? What are you excited about for the future? Yeah, um, if I can actually go back just of just course. a moment and then I'll, I'll answer that. Um, in, the, in the vein of letting application engineers just build applications, um, and trying to foster a, a culture within uh, within Solana that that encourages that, um, we actually just a couple days ago announced um, our newest hackathon. It's called Renaissance. Um, it's being run by um, a new organization that actually spun out of the foundation called Coliseum. Um, and the whole focus is not just you know here's some docs you know whip whip up a couple hundred lines of code. It's how quickly can you go from idea and collaboration with other people building to a pre-seed fundable um, you know, product. Um, and so all the hackathon winners are getting funneled to uh, accelerator programs, getting immediate like intros to potential VCs for, for pre-seed funding. Um, because we don't want to just say, okay, yeah, people built stuff. It's like people wrote code and got product ideas and now have the structure and motivation and incentive to continue building real products on Solana. So uh, I, I think Solana has actually been world-class and like the leader by far in terms of the hackathon that they put on thus far. I know Coliseum is ultimately doing uh, incubator or uh, being able to seed some of these companies. Is Renaissance different from Coliseum? Ren <clears throat> Renaissance is the name of the hackathon event that okay. Coliseum is running. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yes. And yeah. yeah, so we, we've always had like fun and different names for for each of the Solana hackathons. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the you know the the tagline this time, if you saw their you know their tweet thread, they like did you know uh, AI mods on all this like classic Renaissance art, um, and it's like you know can you help bring Solana into the next golden age? You know, as we have this Renaissance of of growth and users and products and and you know renewed interest across the market, um, that it's just super important to capitalize on that. One hundred percent. We, for maybe some of the more like Silicon Valley minded people, is it more kind of like a Y Combinator model or would you aken it to anything else that exists currently? Um, I guess probably similar to um, a Y Combinator uh, in, the, in the sense that like the top of the funnel is, is quite different because you have, it's this open global hackathon. It starts on March 4th, runs for six weeks. 
There's a bunch of different prize tracks. There's you know millions of pre-seed funding available, et cetera. And um, uh, you know we've got developer resources from you know the Solana Foundation. There's third-party resources. People can just get started, jump in the Discord. Even if you're like, I've never written a line of Solana code in my life, or maybe I'm a business person or a, or a product, you're a UX person, not a developer, like get in here. You know, we desperately need um, a lot of skill sets that are not just people who can sling code all day. Um, and so there's this sort of like community flywheel that gets bootstrapped every time we have a hackathon, um, regardless of whether these projects win or not. Um, you know, they get this kind of camaraderie. Hey, I tried something. I got, I learned something. Um, and so there's this kind of broad benefit to the community that I think doesn't exist in like a traditional kind of Y Combinator or Web2 yeah. style hackathon or accelerator. Um, and then at the conclusion of the hackathon, I believe the model that, that Coliseum is taking is, um, you know, we have judges from across the ecosystem. It's not just like, you know, two guys at Coliseum picking, who, you know, who they want. Um, uh, a lot of these, you know, winners can then get kind of as they reach like mid funnel in their way to to success, um, you know, intros to VCs and potential mentorship and, you know, incubation and acceleration. Yeah, it, it is beautiful. I, I truly think one of the things that was core to kind of that Solana being forged through the fire was some of these in-person events, the hackathons that Solana did, but also the online hackathons, because I think we all spend so much time uh, just speaking uh, on Twitter or X and to be able to connect with people uh, either at Foundation, at Coliseum or various VCs, speak with them, have a conversation, get some feedback. That is really invaluable. And it's something that I think the Solana community has done uniquely well outside of other ecosystems is just fostering that community side of things. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, def definitely agree with you there. Um, you know, we'd be nowhere without our builders. We'd certainly be nowhere without our community. Um, you know, the, the Solana Foundation, like we've hosted a bunch of in-person events over the last couple of years. And what's been really exciting this year, 2024 in particular, is we're seeing the, the growth and scale of community-driven events are really out, outpacing and outstripping, you know, the, the things that Foundation is you know, specifically producing, um, which I think is amazing. Um, you know, there was all this hype. So the whole month of February was, I think, the fifth iteration of, of Mountain Dow, which, you know, is this month long builder house uh, that's f from day one been organized by um, a bunch of hardcore builders in the Solana community. Um, you know, they rented a, they like rent a house or a co working space in Salt Lake City and, you know, ski all day and code all night. And it's like uh, an awesome event. And what I observed to my whole team at the foundation was like, you know, a year or two ago, the model was like, hey, Solana Foundation's like going to do an event. We're going to do a hacker house or we're going to sponsor some booth at something. And like, hey, community come and like maybe do a side event, you know, because like Solana Foundation, you know, maybe brings the critical mass. This year, you know, Mountain Dow has always been community run. We went to them <laughs> and I was like, Mountain Dow brought the critical mass. And I was like, hey guys, can like, you know, me and some of my Solana Foundation team show up and hang out with, with all the cool kids? And honestly, like, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's, it's, it's always been like the vision, um, you know, as I've sort of expressed to, to the team, like the goal is, is over time for the foundation to become less important, right? And, and why, that, why is that important that we do that is um, for the community to flourish, they need to be able to be unblocked and kind of bootstrap themselves. And so we just try to remove as many obstacles as possible, um, make it easier to build on chain, um, you know, support particular initiatives, um, but are generally like hands off uh, the sort of direction of, you know, that the ecosystem chooses to innovate. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the same thing true at the community level, right? There's Mountain Dao, um, uh, island Dow is is being looks like it's being put together on some warm island somewhere this summer. I think exact location TBD. Um, Solana Crossroads is happening in Istanbul in May. That's a community run event. Um, the Founders Villa, run by Super Team in Dubai, um, just wrapped up a month of helping a cohort of Solana founders bootstrap 
uh, new companies in the UAE. Um, there's a bunch of in-person like builder meetups supporting the Renaissance Hackathon that I've been seeing pop up You know, all over the world. Teams are like, hey, Renaissance is an online hackathon. It's a global hackathon, but let's get together in person with our local you know, community and, and kick ideas around. Um, and that kind of growth is just, it's just really inspiring and, and really humbling to see, um, you know, people just coming in from every country and just being like, hell yeah, we want to build on Solana. From a basement to worldwide. It has to be a little humbling. It, it is. It's, it's incredibly humbling. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I was telling you earlier, right? Like the, the actual origin of the network, like we, we built like me and a, and a couple of the early engineers by hand, uh, like the first validators that we use to launch Solana mainnet, like in the founder's basement and just a handful of miles from here um, in the summer of 2019, right? We just, you know, I got a corporate credit card and a new egg account and just like ordered all this hardware, shipped it to his house. Um, we slapped it together and we actually racked it um, uh, in a data center here in Denver and they're, they're still running mm -hmm. with those uh, bright green LEDs that was the, uh, the original Solana color was just like black and, and glowing green. Um, so I made sure like to deck out all this. We've got this whole server rack in a data center that's just like black machines glowing green. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, no, I, I think, yeah, the, the Solana community has really been forged by fire. And I think what's now, and we've kind of like talked about this, is that it's easy to use that community is kind of welcoming. Uh, it's not overly complex to just try out Solana and use Jupyter or, or any of these other applications to drip on the network, use a deep in protocol. And I, th I think the more people just experiment with this and get on chain, um, the larger and larger that community becomes at your point, perhaps uh, a foundation becomes more irrelevant over time as uh, the community is really the one in the driver's seat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I sort of have this mantra um, within the foundation, which is give away our wins, right? We're not here to make the Solana Foundation big and important. We're here to make, you know, help make Solana big and important. And Solana is out there. Solana is all of you guys. Um, and we just want to keep as many people kind of unblocked as possible. Because if, if I can remove a block, from one person, I may have removed a block from a hundred people or a thousand people who want to come later. Um, you know, so I want to see like community growth, you know, like just total parabolic up and to the right and, you know, head count influence. Um, a lot of things that foundation are, are basically like level, if not slowly decreasing. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have this belief that, you know, maybe Sun foundation is a lot bigger or does actually a lot more than we, you really guys have do. always stayed pretty lean. Yeah, the, the whole foundation team today, I think is about 70 full-time full -time folks. Um, you know, and that includes like, you know, we've got a DevRel team, we've got a marketing team, we still do events. So we've got like an awesome events team who helps put on our hacker houses and, and produces Breakpoint. Um, uh, you know, a bunch of technical folks that help work with, with the validator community and sort of advocate for validator best practices and integration best practices, producing developer content. Um, we are, you know, we do, we do a lot of grants for developer tools, for public goods, um, for, you know, first of its kind, kind of reference implementations as people use new tech, like token extensions, um, some, you know, academic level research is something we're more interested in funding these days, but all of this stuff ultimately like the real work is happening outside, right? I want to seed as many outside brains as possible with, you know, ideas of what we can do with Solana. How can we make Solana better? Um, and that's, that's really the goal. Yeah. Maybe shifting slightly to some of the more either technical aspect or just um, things that you're excited about on the community level for 2024. Fire Dancer is obviously one big thing. Uh, I think there's now been different uh, client implementations ultimately spinning from labs. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk either about either of those or just what you're excited about as the community continues <coughs> to grow over time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, the sort of direction and, and maturity of the um, protocol process, if you will, like the actual 
you know, pushing core changes to the validator network. Um, that whole process and the community of folks that are participating in it has really grown and changed a lot in the last year. Um, and we're definitely kind of going through, I'll say, some growing pains as we kind of figure out like some processes and some better, you know, uh, you know, mature process, I guess. Um, but yeah, what the landscape looks like right now is um, the uh, the protocol team, the validator team from Solana Labs. Um, spun out. They formed a new company called Anza, Anza Technology. Um, and they are forking the Solana Labs validator, which to date has been like the core primary validator for the Solana network. Um, they're forking that off. Um, and uh, are, I think they announced they're, they're renaming it um, to Agave. Um, and so they're going to continue maintaining the, the Agave validator going forward. Um, and we've also got Jito on the network. Jito is uh, another fork of the Solana Labs uh, validator that optimized for MEV. And something like 50% of the stake on Solana mainnet today runs Jito. So we've already got uh, diversity of, you know, kind of brain power um, uh, that, that's really like powering the, the network and, and contributing things. You know, important to note that Jito is it's like 99% the same code and they just made some modifications in how they do block packing and scheduling um, uh, to kind of power their uh, their MEV uh, solution stack. Um, but there's two more projects coming down the line that I'm really excited about. The first one is, is Fire Dancer. Um, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, I, am, I am confident that the Fire Dancer team, I think is the most high powered, high talent engineering team in all of crypto. Um, I the, the kind of work and optimizations and improvements that these guys are working on, that they you know propose and like argue adamantly with Anatoly and the other engineers about is just mind blowing. Um, and they're building a new validator for Solana from scratch written in, written in C, um, which is different from the labs validator and Jito, which are written in Rust. Um, and in addition to being like a super top-notch engineering team, they're, they're from a team at Jump Trading, which is um, a big you know, financial firm, but they're ultimately a technology firm. Um, uh, they get, um, they have this like great benefit of being the first team to rebuild this. Um, and so all of the sort of battle scars in the Solana Labs validator code base Right, because we sort of had to build the plane as we were flying, and you're touching production code every time Solana Labs wants to make a change or fix a bug. Right, you're like, okay, fix the code, but don't break the network. Um, like Fire Dancer has this great benefit of like they don't need to worry about that. They can be like, this is how it should be. You know, we can re-architecture things. It's still all the same protocol. And what what they're showing in some of these early tests is like 10x to 100x performance improvements in some parts of the stack on the same Solana protocol, on the same hardware that validators are running on mainnet today. That's pretty impressive. I mean, the fact that it's the same hardware and not even increased validators or specs. I mean, just watching Kevin Bowers at the last two uh, Solana breakpoints give his talks were rather remarkable on mm -hmm. how they're talking about <laughs> how light propagates uh, through a chip. Uh, I don't know if you can go much deeper than that. Right. You, you really can't. I mean, you know, there, there's this funny, there's like, I have these two quotes from, you know, Anatoly, right? The, the godfather of Solana and, you know, Kevin Bowers, who's the head of Fire Dancer team, um, right? Anatoly's line for forever was like, you know, blockchain at the speed of light. And Kevin Bowers comes in and he has a whole lecture that is called the speed of light is too slow. Like, like that's kind of the level of brain power that they're pointing at this. And you're right. You, you simply can't get faster than physics. And the original implementation um, that Solana Labs built optimized for, you know, physics, light through fiber, um, you know, continuous streaming, and then data travels across the internet as fast as it does. Um, Fire Dancer is... Uh, you know, improving a lot of the kind of algorithms and protocols on the data propagation, but they're also looking at how fast does data travel within the chip? What route, what physical wiring route does data take when it hits the NIC, the network card from the incoming fiber line and gets to the CPU? And how far does it travel to this core, to that core and to memory? And are you reading and writing from memory 
more times than necessary, adding latency you know, within your system, um, like this is the level of optimization that they're getting. Um, uh, you know, he even has a map of like, you know, worst case t distance for light to travel or data mm -hmm. to travel um, across a, you know, th you know, 10 centimeter wide chip, right? And how can we, you know, optimize for the, for these, these paths? I think the thing that I always drew me to Solana, just being at Tesla previously was like, think from first principles and like question assumptions and physics is the only like true bottleneck. And then kind of hearing Anatoly and the community speak about just how physics was the actual limitation. It really kind of spoke to me as, okay, if you can really push the hardware and write the software in a, such a way that physics is the only limitation. I don't know how you really get that much better than physics. Right. I mean, physics is the limitation for data propagation and parallelism number of cores is the limit for basically parallel processing or how many, you know, how many transactions can you pump through a node, you know, in, in a given cycle or in a given moment or block time. Um, and so this is basically what we optimize for, right? It's data propagation as fast as possible through fiber um, and um, scalable parallelism. So the Solana runtime, the SVM is multi-threaded. It runs, um, I think currently by default on four cores um, on the validator node. Um, there's no reason that that can't scale up eight cores, 16 cores, whatever. Um, Moore's law still holds. There will always be more transistors on a chip. Can will... you talk about that just yeah, a, sure. a little bit more? Like, because there's a lot of debate within, I don't know, Silicon Valley or the tech world is Moore's law dying. How do you add more compute capacity to chips? If you could just dive a little bit deeper into that, would be great. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in like, uh, you know, transistor fab, um, but I think, uh, you know, the, the curve hasn't been broken. Um, you know, we're coming up on some physical limits of like basically how many atoms wide can you make a transistor? Um, uh, I think what's sort of a little underexplored is, um, you know, what happens when we start doing like 3D stacking of transistors, um, right? You can only make them smaller on a, you can make them only so much smaller on a 2D wafer, um, but you know, what happens when you do vertical stacking within a single silicon chip? or have, you know, hyper fast, um, you know, multi-chip architecture. Um, so like, I'm not quite sure what the, you know, what the answer is, but like, as long as Intel and TSMC and Samsung and, you know, like the big chip fabs in the world, as long as they continue to compete yeah. and continue to exist and, you know, Intel and, and uh, AMD and Nvidia, Right, like the chips will always get faster, whether it is because of Moore's law or because they figured out how to put more chips on a card or any other innovation. Like the, I think what's almost more important than Moore's law is basically ca like capitalism competition, yeah. right? Intel and AMD compete with one another, which means they'll always have faster chips every year, regardless of how they do it. Um, and so Solana is, you know, basically able to scale with number of cores, number of threads, um, that you can put on a single node. However, it's, put, you know, whatever the particulars of its construction might be. Yeah. The other thing that maybe I think we should kind of go a bit further on is just the all to all like data sync. Uh, in my podcast with Anatoly, I really tried to have him explain it in depth because I still, I don't feel like it's fully understood by most. And to me, it's one of really the Solana like secret sauce. I think you kind of mentioned like the news event in Japan going to New York or Dubai to New York. Mm -hmm. um, and that all to all communication is really, I think, something special uh, that I think over time builders will kind of figure out how to better utilize that. And something I think more broadly, the market just does not appreciate at all. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so you know the the idea here, is sort of, you know, one of the things we say, like it's it's not a blockchain, it's it's a global state machine, right? And so, like, what what the heck does that mean? Um, the idea is that Solana can synchronize state, right, which is the balance in your account, all the data, you know, of of the current state of the blockchain, um, to anywhere and from anywhere on the globe, um, as fast as data can get there, right? Which is the whole speed of light thing we were talking about. Um, so every node on the Solana network, of which there are currently 3,300 nodes in 40 countries on six continents. Very decentralized. Right. Um, every single node on the network 
um, synchronizes global state, um, and they do so continuously. Um, you know, currently it's like on the order of like one second, right? Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Depends on you know some software bottlenecks that we're continuously working through to make the implementation faster. Um, but um, yeah, so if sorry, let me see how I want to just describe this. Um, um, if you have like a piece of information that should be that you know you want to make public that's newsworthy that is uh, a piece of news or a market movement a price of some asset somewhere in the world um, that shouldn't just be limited to you know the traders who pay whatever they pay every a million dollars a year for a bloomberg terminal um, that data that price that market um, is available to everybody um, at the same time um, so there's no sort of added layers or complexity or settle down here, come up here on the DA layer. Um, every node synchronizes the global state continuously. Um, that's really kind of the simplest way to say it. Um, Anatoly kind of explained it as like everybody gets the exact same kind of cable length as you would hook up to like New York or like the NASD, uh, yes. uh, where you're getting the same information at pretty much at the same time as everybody else. And there's no unfair advantage. Everybody, really anybody can add a full node to the network and give mm -hmm. them that equal and fair access to uh, that data synchronization. And this is something that fundamentally L2s kind of you can kind of do it within an app chain, but it just depends on how large the app chain gets. But I think the real alpha of a Solana is just specifically being designed for that all to all and having a large quorum or a large number of nodes where anybody can really add a node and receive that information. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of data that, you know, people are pushing right now, um, particularly, you know, DeFi markets and with like the, the, data providing solutions like Pith and Switchboard, um, that it's really important that it gets everywhere at the same time. Everyone gets equal access. Like you said, anyone can run a full node. Um, and yeah, it's sort of this like great sort of democratizing force of access to information. And more importantly, the ability to act on that information. Everybody gets the same ability to read from the blockchain. Everyone has the same ability to write to the blockchain. Um, and so this sort of leveling the playing field of access um, to, to read, but also access to write and transact and capitalize on value, whether it's financial value or, you know, some uh, expressed opinion through a DAO vote or a political thing, like everybody can engage um, at the same platform. And because of how this scales, because it's so fast, um, you don't have to worry that you know, just because someone's doing an NFT mint, I'm not going to be able to do my, you know, my DeFi swaps. Yeah. Right? I mean, in fin financial markets, people pay large sums of money to make sure they, they have that real-time data access. Uh, because if you're trading or um, have some livelihood, making sure you get that most up-to-date information is really pertinent. Uh, and so it's very cool. I, I think... Uh, one of the other things that kind of gets me excited is just like that NASDAQ on a blockchain mm -hmm. kind of having these heterogeneous kind of order books, so to speak, like Japan, London, all be collapsed into a single state machine. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful vision. And I think one that I've been thinking more about. Yeah. I think the, the on-chain order book is something that is really uniquely only possible on Solana. Um, uh, because you need to be able to, you know, see the price moving, get your bids in, you know, like if you look at any order book, like 90% of all the orders are, are cancels, right? People open a position, they close a position, they open, they close. Um, and this only works when you can submit transactions super fast and super cheap. Um, and the cost of canceling 99 out of 100 orders that you pay in transaction fees needs to be less than, you know, the financial opportunity of trying to close that trade, even if it's, you know, only a couple points. Um, and so that kind of real time market, you know, really can only only happen on Solana. Um, and as we're seeing now with more people interested in RWAs and there's renewed interest in tokenized securities and we might see, you know, 
you know, tokenized stocks or bonds or real estate loans, you know, you're starting to bring, these are not speculative assets, right? These are real productive assets um, that, you know, have a market price and a lot more people can have access, you know, the ability to access these markets and, and, and access these assets, um, you know, in, in a fair way without, um, you know, taking on, I'll say, some of the speculative risk of like assets that might be endogenous to uh, or, uh, you know, native to, to the crypto ecosystem. Yeah, it's, I don't know, there is, I still, there's a lot of things that I think people don't appreciate about Solana. And I think the exciting thing now is the infrastructure, uh, the additional clients that are coming online, they now, I, I think I, I can see like a very clear path to this vision or this world where you kind of have this synchronized order book. Um, and something that I am very excited about. It's been a yeah. long road. It, it it has. It's it's been a long it's been a long road, and it also has been a short road. I think we <laughs> you know we have like uh, you know a lot of short term memory in crypto, right? Solana Mainnet was launched in March of 2020, right? It's less than four years old, and look at where we've come. And like that gives me, uh, like so much inspiration and excitement for like what's going to happen in another four years you know how many more things like where is the state of the ecosystem going to be people are going to be doing things we can't, we haven't even thought of yeah um and i'm here for it <laughs> maybe shifting slightly i think one exciting thing that uh labs recently announced was token extensions mm -hmm. can you touch a little bit upon token extensions and what gets you excited about um that more broadly yeah absolutely um so token extensions um, is actually something that has been sort of in the works for almost two years now. Um, it was uh, originally known as Token 2022. Um, we sort of, you know, renamed, rebranded it. Engineers are great at uh, naming things. Yeah, they're great at naming things. Yeah, it was, it was a good name in 2022 when they started the repo. Um, and then we launched in 2024. Um, but uh, that's all good. Um, so what token extensions are, are a new token standard for Solana. And what, what does this mean? So uh, currently there's, there's basically one token standard on Solana. There's a single token program. Um, uh, often people refer to it as like SPL token or token keg. And it's a single smart contract. It's you know, been audited a hundred times. And every, every token on Solana, with the exception of Sol, the, you know, the native token, um, is minted through this SPL token program. Um, and I, I say this because it's, there's actually a distinction here from how like ETH and, and ERC20 tokens work, which um, I think is an important distinction to make because it really ties into what flexibility token extensions provide. You know, on ETH, you have the ERC20 standard, which says, if you want to launch a token, here's how the kind of interfaces want, should look. And you write your smart contract, you write your token to have whatever special behavior you want. Um, and while let's just know what the ERC20 sort of interface looks like. Um, and that sometimes introduces smart contract risk. You, you, you know, you, you get a new token, but you don't actually know, or maybe some users are not, you know, informed enough to know how to safely, you know, receive some of this. They don't know what these tokens may or may not be doing. Um, on Solana, the, uh, this is true of all programs, smart contracts are separated from, um, their accounts. So we say like programs on Solana are stateless. So the token program does not have any tokens in it. It just has executable code. And then there's lots of other accounts on chain that belong to users that contain tokens and data about what the token mint address was, what the token balance is. And so people can mint tokens um, and users can receive tokens knowing that as you know, they all came from the same program and I'm not taking any iterative smart contract risk and all these tokens invoke the same, you know, token transfer instructions and rules and, and safety guardrails. So that's sort of how that's, you know, in general, how tokens and programs work on Solana with token extensions. There's a, a new token program that we were called token 22. Um, it supports all of the existing features of legacy tokens of SPL tokens. And the, the most important thing is it enables various, what we call extensions, or basically optional configuration flags that a token issuer can set on their token at the time of mint 
that enable all sorts of unique properties and behaviors in a single smart contract, in a single mint. So you don't need to add additional smart contracts or added complexity. Um, so for example, um, we have, there's a, an extension called transfer hooks, which basically says, um, anytime that a holder of my token that has a transfer hook, anytime they transfer a token, invoke some other logic, right? Whatever it is, um, you know, run some extra program. Anytime the blockchain detects that, you know, I hold, you know, this meme coin that has a transfer hook and I send it to you, something else happens in addition to that. Um, there is an extension for uh, transfer fees. So it says, hey, anytime that I transfer to you this token with a transfer fee, 5% or 10 bips goes back to the issuer or goes back to some fixed address. So this can be used for things like um, permanent royalty enforcement on secondary markets if someone uses this for NFTs. Um, there is an extension called permanent delegate authority, which we desperately need a new name for, I think. Um, basically what it means is the issuer of the token has ultimate authority to uh, revoke the token from your wallet. So obviously you wouldn't want this with like permissionless tokens like SOL or USDC, but what this could be used for are things like um, subscriptions, right? Time expiring subscriptions, KYC tokens that, you know, hey, you need to renew your KYC once a year. You do the, you do the thing, you, you know, you get a token and 365 days later, it's automatically removed from your wallet. And in the meantime, the, you know, the platform that does the token gating check, you know, has assurance. Okay, well, I know it's got a transfer hook or a, or a delegated authority. So as long as you've got this token, I know your authorization is good. Yeah, it, it was it was very funny. I recently did a podcast with Nick White, one of the co-founders of Celestia. And we were kind of talking about kind of more modular roadmap versus the integrated mode roadmap. And we were talking about high level token extensions. And in my point of view, how kind of the more integrated blockchains, the high throughput blockchains are becoming more customizable over time with things like token extensions. You can do private token transfers, as well as many of the things that you mentioned, the token hooks, and ultimately giving developers more and more flexibility to build the applications that, that you want. And so to me, it's kind of funny because you have the kind of modular roadmap that's uh, trouting all these customizations, but then you're also having kind of the integrated blockchains that are having more customizations, um, uh, more flexibility for engineers to build the applications they want over time. Right. Like how many front end engineers or, or, you know, TypeScript devs want to like build their own private internet? Yeah. I, I do think I, we're I, very much in like the <laughs> intranet versus the internet phase and blockchains. Yeah, I think, you know, like if you go back 20 or 30 years, right, to like businesses that were first adopting the internet, right, they would, you know, they'd build their own server rooms, they'd run their own cable, um, you know, or phone lines uh, between corporate offices um, and go through like huge overhead um, just so that you could have a company intranet, yeah. right? Well, what do you, we don't do that today, right? Yep. I mean, sure, you still have IT and you have your server rooms, but like it's it's all SaaS, right? It's cloud. You can have virtual private cloud in three clicks on AWS and you can have a lot of the same benefits um, uh, of like what they were trying to build with sort of corporate intranet. Yeah. And I think there is like a mind shift that has definitely been happening and I, I want to kind of see it continue of people like are a little bit trapped in this I have to build my own infrastructure in order to build my own app kind of mindset and come play on Solana. Like it's all here for you. Uh, just come with a product idea and build your app. And I think to that point, I mean, we've seen various projects like Helium uh, originally start with kind of the app chain model and realize, hey, we want to be application engineers. Let's not focus on infrastructure. Let's move to a high throughput watch like Solana mm -hmm. and focus on the product, which is Helium Network. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's a perfect example. Um, there were actually a, a couple like, that was a really cool moment, I think, in Solana history last year. Um, you know, yeah, the Hel Helium Mobile, awesome product. They do um, radio hotspots for IoT devices. Now they have Helium Mobile, a, a 
decentralized cellular network that is fully running on Solana, they built their own blockchain um, originally. And they were trying to build a blockchain, maintain a blockchain just for their application and build a decentralized wireless network product on top of it. And it just like the product was great and the blockchain kept falling over. And they were like, we don't want to deal with this infrastructure. We just want to focus on our product. And so, you know, they, they came to us, they with, you know, we kind of helped them with the, the migration. Um, and one of the cool things that was like a really um, a convergence on a single day, I think it was last summer, maybe it was before that, I, it's all kind of a blur. Um, so Helium minted, I think like seven or 800,000 compressed NFTs on Solana, each one representing a Helium hotspot on the Helium network. So this was like over, I don't know, a 24, 48 hour period. During that period where we're like having all this traffic and all these NFTs minted on Solana, there was the Mad Lads Mint, yeah. which at the time was like the biggest and most hyped NFT mint, I think ever on Solana. It was one of the biggest NFT mints ever anywhere, I believe. Um, and, you know, with a lot of hot NFT mints, you know, you get a ton of bot traffic, you get spam network, you know, traffic patterns were, were out of control. And to be honest with you, if this had happened two years prior, um, these were the, the kind of things that like um, caused so many like network issues and, and outages in like the 2021 timeframe was we had this NFT boom and there was like not good traffic, con you know, control flow and local fee markets and quick were not implemented yet. Um, this is the kind of thing that would have been like, a, like shit, are they gonna kill the network? And everything went off without a hitch. Helium continued to mint for their deep in migration from their own chain. We had the biggest NFT mint in Mad Lads happen at the same day. Um, and everything was just like, just humming along. Um, and that really was like an awesome attestation to the level of improvement um, and robustness of Solana, even from 2021 um, and 2022, when we like admittedly had uh, quite a number of, of performance issues. We had, you know, a couple downtime incidents to 2023 and now 2024, where we're seeing huge amounts of throughput, like these, these crazy mints. We had, you know, the Jito airdrop and the Jupe airdrop happen in the last couple of weeks, a uh, couple months, and everything is just smooth as butter. Um, and so that's like really awesome to see um, how even in, in just a year, like the tech can, can really stabilize and, um, you know, really, really battle harden um, for these more advanced use cases that we're seeing now. Yeah. No, it's it's been very impressive. I think there is always kind of like the startup pitfalls of like moving fast and breaking things versus kind of being a little bit too slow and not being as aggressive. And I think Solana at some time has prioritized one and then shifted back to another, but it really seems now like the network is getting to the point, especially after Fire Dancer and multiple clients um, are running the software on the network that these redundancies and network outages sh should really be a thing of the past. Absolutely. I mean, we have certainly in the early days and probably up until relatively recently, definitely taken the move fast and break things model. And that has, that has certainly caused some pain and it has enabled Solana to iterate really fast, um, improve things that are broken, um, and, you know, really stay at the, stay at the forefront. Um, and one of the things that we are pushing now is like, hey, we actually have, there is so much performance overhead baked into the network and so much robustness today um, that, you know, the priority is shifting to, you know, continued hardening, you know, really um, aggressive testing, formal verification um, as we prepare for FireDancer to, you know, integrate onto mainnet. Um, uh, which which will in itself bring all sorts of safety and robustness guarantees. We need to make sure that sort of the house is in order um, because as soon as we have a, a true new client, right? Like uh, Anza and Jito are, are quite similar. We've got Fire Dancer coming written in C. We also have a third client um, called SIG. It's being built by the Syndica team. They're writing it. They're writing their validator in ZIG. Um, it's in kind of the earlier stages of development now, but we will have three completely independent validators written in three totally different programming languages, um, you know, in the coming, you know, year, a couple years, um, the kind of safety and reliability guarantees we get with, um, you know, a true second validator, like cannot be overstated. And this actually will make Solana the only chain other than Ethereum 
that has like two or, or more than one like fully independent uh, validator implementation. So that a bug in one should not be a catastrophic risk to the network. Yeah, no, it's it's very impressive and all a lot of hard engineering and credit to foundation and others to take those risks to build multiple client implementations. Maybe shifting a little bit, I think you and I are both passionate kind of about like the deep end category as a whole, uh, how deep end is really enabling new ways of capital formation, but even particularly around uh, what I like to call digital commodities, but I think you have a different name for them as kind of the compute currency. Mm -hmm. um, can you dive into that like specific area of deep end and why you're excited about it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the idea with Deepin, right, is you can use the sort of capital efficiency of a blockchain to bootstrap some physical network that does something out there in the world, right? It's not just, um, you know, trading meme coins back and forth, but, you know, with Helium, they have bootstrapped um, an IoT network. They have bootstrapped a cellular network um, with token incentives that are unique to the blockchain. And, you know, they provide these incentives for people to put hotspots on their roofs and hook them up and provide cellular service to their region. Um, you know, HiveMapper, uh, sort of a similar model, using the blockchain to stream token payments to build a mapping platform. Um, and these are really cool examples. Um, and I think what's what's like the, the, the prescient point here is um, the, the sort of capital efficiency of building this sort of token incentivized physical network can allow um, ambitious small startups to compete with entrenched, you know, industry giants, right? No one could build today, you know, with the amount of capital, like a cellular network to compete with the coverage of Verizon if you had to build all the towers and pay for all the antennas and pay for the labor to, you know, climb the antennas and install the radios. Um, uh, but it turns out you can. And it's called Helium, and they are bootstrapping. It's basically like a community-driven um, uh, cellular network, right? Where people have incentives to build the infrastructure themselves to provide that service. Similar, HiveMapper um, is competing with Google Maps. Um, I think they have, I don't remember what the latest stats were, something like, Eight, ten, or more percent of the world's roads. It was very impressive and like fairly in, quickly in just a few months, yeah. right? Because people who are driving already, Uber drivers, delivery folks, truck drivers, um, people who spend a lot of time in their car, can get the the Hive Mapper camera, hook it up, provide this you know street view mapping, and earn rewards for it. And they are getting, they're like rapidly approaching on the kind of coverage that Google Maps Street View has with a much higher time resolution, um, right? Google Maps might, just, you know, drive your street once a year or, you know, depending on where you are, maybe more, maybe less. Um, you know, in, in certain areas, in certain cities, right? HiveMapper is updating daily, maybe multiple times a day. And there's, you know, reward curves for, for where they need coverage. So you can do things with this kind of technology, like identify potholes or road damage or hazards um, and when they've been fixed and you can push that to some, you know, uh, navigation apps that you simply can't do with, um, a street view app that updates only once a year. Yeah. Um, I think more broadly, which, you know, maybe to, to your question, there's this idea of like compute currency, um, which is our whole lives are becoming digital. Our economy has become digital. The way we interact with assets and other people is digital. Are we sure we're not in a... Uh or Apple glass headsets. It's all Elon's. Um, <laughs> we're all in a simulation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we might be anyway, in which case, you know, cool. Yeah, I'm so here the, for it. The life, uh, it was interesting. I was watching like Ready Player One recently. Uh -huh. And like, it doesn't take too much of like an imagination to really and hopefully envision slightly a better world than Ready Player One. But people have kind of these uh, virtual reality glasses. You're kind of in the metaverse and... Uh, more and more people are kind of uh, doing things online. Right. I mean, I think it's, we underestimate how much thing, like how much of our lives really is online, right? If your phone and your laptop just disappeared tomorrow and you could never see them again, like, what would you do? Like, <laughs> um, you know, you could figure out a way to eat, hopefully, and feed yourself and shelter yourself. Yeah. But like, 
your work takes place online. Your communications are online. Your, your history and your memories, your, your photos, your email history, like everything is there. Um, and we currently, you know, pay dollars or we pay with our attention through, through ads to these service providers for the, the benefit of letting us use their compute resources, right? Google gives you Gmail for free because they track through your data. They give you nice personalized ads, which people pay for. Um, so you pay in your time or your dollars for these compute resources, whether you know it or not. Um, I think one of the cool things that crypto and you know Deepin is like a subset of this is sort of surfacing what is you know the compute currency and what people are willing to pay for these resources. Um, and I think there's a, an interesting example in like the the convergence of AI and crypto. Um, I think. There's, there's some interesting kind of workflows where someone could say, hey, I wanna make sure that I'm using AI to do some task, right? Whether it's communication, email, you know, something beyond like this silly image generation memes that we're seeing today, um, funny though they may be. Um, and I wanna be assured that every time I invoke this LLM, I'm getting the same, you know, it's running through the same LLM so I can get kind of reliable results, right? And so you could do some sort of cryptographic proof of, this is the LLM, this was his training model, and here's the, you know, and sign with that hash, um, you know, along with the, the results data, for example. And so you can get like this idea of a repeatable AI agent on demand um, that I'm willing to pay for, or someone else is willing to pay to access this particular model that I, you know, that I trained up or third party trained up. Um, and it's a little meta because blockchains themselves are just distributed compute. Right, like if you look at the native token, Sol or ETH, right, um, regardless of you know the price or the you know your your opinions on on the monetary aspects, um, what are these tokens if not ways to pay for distributed compute? Please execute my transaction and change some account balance. Um, and so building basically a kind of a whole another layer on top of that. Um, here is some token. Please execute some compute on my behalf um, that I that is valuable to me. Right, whether it's out in the physical world or kind of in the AI or GPU rendering world. Yeah, I, I I like the word digital commodities just because it's like, all right, we need the like resources of bandwidth, compute, storage, and those are going to be kind of the commodities of like the next revolution of our digital lives. I'm trying to push it, but I don't know if it'll catch on. <laughs> yeah. Um. Very interesting. I I think. There's, we've touched upon a lot in terms of like the community aspect, kind of really kind of some of the ups and downs of not only Solana, but the entire industry, some of the cyclical nature of that kind of now coming through 2024, the kind of upswing that we're on, but really more so from a community aspect and that community really being battle hardened through some extremely difficult times. And now the community is really taking charge, whether that's Mountain Dow, whether that's different hackathons around the world and people just experimenting with the Solana network and saying, this is a cool place to build. It's fast, it's cheap, it's easy, and I can focus on building my application. And yes. so I think what I'm really excited about for is now kind of less infrastructure, so to speak, as we've kind of been alluding to, and more focus on the applications and what people can ultimately build on Solana. And that's what I'm personally excited for 2024. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, is there anything particular that you kind of want to, as we wrap up the podcast, that you want to double click on or make sure people are kind of aware of? Um, I don't know, just... Uh... It's like, you know, come on in the water, the water is fine. Um, try Solana. Um, you know, we've, there's like a ton of awesome apps out there. Um, you know, for people to just like experiencing Solana, if you've only ever used say ethel one is like a viscerally different experience. Yeah. You don't have to love it for whatever your reasons, but just give it a try. Yeah. Right. Um, there's this cool app that we built actually years ago as a, as a demo. And I think it's still pertinent today. It's called uh, break it's break dot Solana dot com. And it's, it's basically, it's a keyboard mashing game, right? And every time you, you smash the space board, it sends a transaction. Um, and it's just a live stream of like all your pending transactions from keyboard smash. 
and you know watching like the tail of them switch from red to green as they confirm just like that and you can go look on the block explorer and see every single transaction that landed or you know it's not just a front end um and that has been like the the like aha moment or like you know the iphone moment for people like coming to solana of like the first time you're like oh this is what it's supposed to feel like yeah. you know come try it see what you think <laughs> All right, maybe as we wrap up, just a couple rapid fire questions. All right, hit me. Maybe throw a couple spicy ones in there. <laughs> um, is Fire Dancer overhyped or underhyped? Underhyped. Underhyped. Um, there's other kind of networks primarily based out of Silicon Valley. Any thoughts around kind of competition uh, with like these other networks in the high throughput space? Um, it's something that we definitely like keep an eye on for sure. Um, you know, um, I think no one should be so proud as to think just because, you know, we might be the incumbent or the bigger player now that we're going to be forever. Um, key example, BlackBerry uh, once had 95% of the mobile uh, market and now they have zero. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, one can write faster languages and fork a blockchain and, and learn from a playbook. What you cannot fork is a community. And I think Solana has like one of the most feral, awesome and committed uh, communities of builders um, that don't want to be anywhere else. Awesome. Uh, L2s. Cool. <laughs> like <laughs> Restaking. Um, interesting in theory, possibly some very unexplored risks on the edge cases. Cool. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for uh, nerding out on with me uh, through the ups and downs and really appreciate what Solana Foundation has done for the entire globe. I think we're really at the precipice of something special and appreciate all your hard work throughout the years. Awesome. Thank you very much.